Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So we begin our lecture top the topic uh, is uh, taking an ethnographic perspective towards the research uh, in the area of folk and minor art. Uh, to understand the topic, uh, we must go through different details uh, about the nature of any kind of cultural studies that has some sociological aspect. And when we look at habitual art or folk and minor art that is connected to um, all these kind of categories which can be better defined as vernacular art or there can be different term given to, to that. Uh, that is also a, a matter of a greater research. Uh, so, we will try to understand this from a ethnographic perspective and there are researchers uh, that are done in the area from that point of view and that made it uh, even more relevant in uh, the context. So, according to K. G. Subramaniam, a culture cannot survive in isolation as a conserved habitual uh, entity or by depending uh, solely on market demand. The society is changing. So, uh, individual ethnicity and sophistication uh, might predominate uh, over the community scale. There are possibilities that the way it is surviving in today's context may not prevail for long and uh, it is also seen that uh, slowly it is focusing on the individual skill, the individual understanding. It is only the visual style that is evolving and still maintaining its identity and I think we have discussed in that matter uh, in detail in the earlier lectures and uh, I provided you with the clue to understand it in a greater detail. And after that to understand its uh, ethnographic significance, we are walking the same route with a slightly different bend. So, uh, if we quote another cultural researcher uh, named Angela McRobbie, uh, she suggested uh, a general method in uh, cultural studies uh, that is popularly known as three E's. Angela McRobbie's method of three E's are empirical, ethnographic and experimental that has a sociological angle to the cultural research. Working with living human tradition involves empirical changes in sociocultural fiber. According to Michael Pickering, a cultural researcher, according to him, the implication of research methodology is examined as the experience is often common to both researcher and the researched.
what he meant by that uh, can take a different perspective as we match that with our previous study where we felt that this is a both way happening uh, in the field of research where the researcher and the researched object uh, when the researched object is also something which is connected to human, human livelihood or uh, human being as such, then it is a two way process and there it goes through some synergic uh, condition where both are benefited from each other in the process of research and that makes it more uh, fascinating yet complicated. We talk of life experience, but experience always involves interpretation of what happens in life, of what makes our perceptions, feelings and actions meaningful. This depends on how they come into expression and are conceptualized, organized and given temporal identity or in other words how experience is given the quality of narrative. Michael Pickering, Experience and Social World, page 19. So, it is all about how we relate to the uh, outer world and conduct research in that perspective in mind, which uh, includes feeling, actions and that gives the meaning of our study and we feel the study is uh, worthwhile uh, and can be taken further. So, uh, it also provides us with a vision uh, to connect stories with each other into a frame of narrative. So, when we say that we are transforming our experience, uh, we represent it uh, into a narrative connection. So, it gives us the story and we build up uh, the leaving conditions and uh, where it is coming from and where it stays, how they are leaving, where it is going to and it gives us the uh, timeless identity of the past, present and future. So, for this context we are picking up the second E which is the ethnographic angle, the methodology that follows the ethnographic perspective for the cultural research and then what we see that the study of folk culture has a structural division. One, it is form centric, and two is oration centric. Pradya Ghosh, in his uh, study in the book uh, named Bangla Lokushilpa, or the folkloric practice of Bengal refers to a group of anthropologists who embraced uh, folklore as the holistic cultural phenomenon, whereas Samuel P. Beard indicated it is all including quality that it uh, includes everything into it. And let us see what are the things that it includes.
Pradyat Ghosh looks at it as the holistic cultural phenomenon as I said, Samuel P. Beard calls it the all including quality uh, is emphasized in his writing Kenneth W. Clerk and Mary W. Clerk quotes that uh, folklore is a universal topic, its substance includes material from all areas. Study of folklore according to Pradit Ghosh include food, mental acts, language, amusement and recreation, festivals, health and treatment, body language, and of course, art. Folk life similarly include cookery, faith and belief, folk literature, sports, comics, religious festivals, medicines, dance performances, art and craft, folk culture, that is our course of study for now, that includes domains like history, that turns into cultural history, geography, anthropology, sociology, psychology, fine arts, aesthetics, and linguistics, folk art follows the need of local inhabitants in terms of taste and the use of method and material. Folk art is seen as a successful culmination of complex primitive emotions. Binar Ghosh is a very important name that in his book, Poshimonger Shangushkriti, the culture of West Bengal, refers to Gordon Shell's social evolution theory
by Gordon Shell. where he says that uh, there is a prescription of another modular classification in the area of folklore as being evolutionist, diffusionist, functionalist and structuralist in nature. In Europe, this kind of art practices are recognized as peasant art, traditional art, colonial art, regional art. Provincial art, naive art, and so on. But the art forms have fine differences between them. They flourish in a unique but restrictive conditions such as isolation, lack of academic education lack of material wealth, regional confinement, local medium, mechanically simple process, characteristically accomplished and non-mechanically uh, done, the lack of accuracy, uncommon imports, single craftsmanship, orthodox style, repetition of common mode of style from time uh, immemorial and uh, free from foreign influences. So, the artistic impulse is matchlessly mingled with elements of natural endowment, hereditary skill, environmental ethics. and cultural awareness. That also ensures its cognitive qualities, art is all about expression. And in folk art, expression is based on cognition, feeling,
affection simple and complex emotion it remains a crucial question as uh, it like how classical norms rule the elementary compositions of folk painting uh, when we look at them we feel that there are lots of traditional canons or compulsory examples that they are following in a regular basis and we often wonder that what must be the reason but it's not very difficult to also understand that when they belong to a culture and getting exposure to the classical texts through many different reasons because their work is constantly connected to the uh, religious and uh, cultural texts uh, throughout uh, and they are exposed to many different texts and uh, that way they are illustrating, they are interpreting all those things. Uh, they will be influenced by the basic content of them and uh, will definitely be curious about finding out the main resources, uh, the sources rather. So, uh, in a way when we look at the compositional aspects, we see a local traditional temple which is patronized by a local ruler which is coming up in some places. Uh, the folk artists are watching them also uh, picking up motives and the forms which are highly classical or maybe it has a eclectic quality into it but they are picking them up and personalizing it, they are representing it in their own typical style and that is the beauty of it, the, of this personalization making it your own and uh, representing it, representing it at several times uh, in your own way that makes it very unique. However, we will just try to see that uh, how they got um, influenced by some of the old texts and that worked as an operational factor behind setting up the rules for the folk art and its practice. So, uh, as we see that uh, the painting, uh, paintings are rich in mythological content uh, and th that seldom have arbitrary notions in the conception and execution. The myth, moral, grammar, cosmology, uh, gen genealogies metrics and rhetoric of Veda, Purana, Upanishad and similar ancient texts as a passing knowledge uh, periodically influenced the fiber of Indian folk paintings. Vishnu Dharmotar Purana that I was mentioning that has worked as a uh, source for their work for a very long time. Uh, in the third Kanda of uh, Vishnu Dharmotar Purana, uh, we see there is a there, there are information that governs all traditional and ritualistic activities of ancient time because this is one book where some rules were written and uh, the rules were also followed and that is quite uh, evident it is quite obvious that those rules were followed later and the principle that are uh, written there in a conversational form where there are characters like uh, Mark and uh, and uh, Bajra, they are uh, sitting together in a conversation and it is a discourse that is taking place and through their dialogues, their conversation, uh, they are teaching the traditional painters the methods of art, what has to be followed, which are the compulsory rules. Uh, they are also uh, going to the core of the ethos of image making and picture making. So, let us read uh, a small part from there that is translated by Stella Cambridge. Uh, that is Vishnu Dharmotara part 3, uh, a treatise on <coughs> Indian painting and uh, image making, uh, second revised and enlarged edition, uh, Calcutta University Press uh, printed in 1928, uh, like I am reading from page uh, 3 to 5. Vishnu Purana may not have been there earlier than the second half of the 4th century CE. The chapters of Vishnu Dharmotara that deals with painting must have been compiled in the 7th century CE. Uh, the text canonized the measurements of body, leg, face and proportions 
through a conventional discourse between Vajra and Markandeya. Markandeya said, without a knowledge of the art of dancing, the rules of painting are very difficult to be understood. Hence, no work of this earth, O king, should be done even with the help of this too, for something more has to be known. Vajra said, please speak to me about the art of dancing and the rules of paintings you will tell me afterwards for O oh, twice born one. The rules of the art of dancing imply those of the art of painting. Markandeya said, The practice of dancing is difficult to be understood by the one who is not acquainted with music. Without music, dancing cannot exist at all. So, it gives us uh, another clue that it, it talks about a completion that takes it to the level of performing art, which has all this different mediums of expression complementing each other. Uh, so, without the knowledge of music and rhythm, dance is incomplete. Without the uh, knowledge of dance, drawing is incomplete. It is almost like if uh, a person is dancing, that means they are creating form and those forms are highly ephemeral, they are just creating, getting created and disappearing during a performance. And when they are creating the same form with the help of brush and ink, it is just staying in that place uh, for uh, a few uh, more time. And uh, that is the relation between all these things and they are so well synchronized the whole idea. Uh, that it is perhaps working as a guiding factor that gives it the source of sustenance, uh, that it is a completion of knowledge and that indicates to the multidisciplinary aspect of it. So, the expression of painting is not self-sufficient according to Vishnu Dharmotar Purana and gets multiplied in effect with performance and reaches completion. Ultimately, the text uncovers rule of color application, composition, scale, proportion and style to achieve the aesthetic parameters to strike a balance between the subjectivity and objectivity of artistic expression. In order to analyze the contemporary range of folk paintings, it is considered important to link them with the ancient text to follow the threat of changing in the execution and the truth of conformity to traditional roots. Bharat Shilpe Murti, that means form or idol, the form in Indian art, translated by Sukumar Rai, some notes on Indian artistic anatomy written by. Uh, Abhinindranath Tagore and another book Sadanga or the six limbs of Indian painting. The Indian Society of Oriental Art has published it in Calcutta 1921 uh, are the two very good sources of information related to the rules of traditional art in Indian and Chinese context. This is purely for your reference if you really want to know uh, what were the written rules in classical art forms, these are the two sources and uh, I would like to share some of the information to you additionally. And the square and circle of Indian art by Kapila Vatsayan, the second edition 1997, that book is available by Abhina publication, uh, is another very important source where the doctrine of Indian art and aesthetics is duly documented. The practice of folk painting is regional and grows in isolated locations that we know and it varies in style and execution. Sometimes the style is very consciously pro protected into a community or into the state. They have their own policies to protect them within the state. And it is also uh, an experience uh, for many that uh, 
when we talk to the folk artist of today's time who visit uh, galleries who participate in different workshops uh, who interact with each other uh, they sometimes feel that uh, when they work with uh, another craftsman or another uh, folk artist from a different culture from a different region which is not very far off they belong to a same country and uh, they they share the same uh, ethical value uh, they feel that the style that the other person is following there are lots of things to take from there but still they try to maintain their uh, own identity as their style like any other fine artists who appreciate the other style but still stick to their own style of uh, expression that gives them their own identity that keeps them rooted and grounded so uh, i'll mention quite a few uh, points that uh, you note down so the ritualistic foundation that decides the compositional organization connected to the ritual of vedic yagya वेदिक यज्ञ नाथशास्त्र वास्तु पुरुष शिल्प पंजर and sangeeta purusha that is largely followed by the artists architects sculptors performing artists who work with indian principle which is traditional they are studied to realize the holistic connection uh, the connection with the holistic principle that connect the streams together despite multiple diversity and that is uh, a realization uh, that works as an outcome of a ethnographic study so we look at them from a purely ethnographic perspective at times that includes all these things so looking at them from the aesthetic perspective is just a part of it and it it's part of a cultural study so we need to also incorporate a little bit of uh, 
cultural uh, historical methods to understand it fully and there we follow a mixed method where it is not just experience as we said because experience is also working both ways and it is also very important to know that uh, experience cannot just happen because experience is also an outcome uh, of observation that uh, happens with a whole lot of preconceived notion into us. Uh, we discussed earlier also that even if we go from a uh, free flowing and total original mind, then also uh, we cannot be totally free from our previous experiences, because the present now is just becomes past within a second with the uh, blinking of an eye. Apart from those ideas, we can simply understand that uh, the moment we experience, we have the urge to interpret and that happens as a uh, natural process and there is no point uh, dividing them and restricting the natural processing that our brain does as a natural activity. So, their experience, documentation, observation uh, quickly uh, uh, gets translated uh, or transformed into interpretation and the interpretation builds up narrative with by connecting all the experiences together. Uh, into the form of a story and that is the beauty of this study and that keeps us uh, excited uh, to uh, go into the field of this research uh, over and again.